This presentation is uh, designed to provide you with a brief history of newborn screening and to bring you up to date on current screening and, and some of the issues. Uh, at least three uh, events uh, led up to newborn screening before Guthrie came on the scene. The first is the development of the concept of the uh, inborn era of metabolism. The concept was developed by this gentleman, uh, Archibald Garrard, Sir Archibald Garrard, a, a distinguished uh, physician in England uh, back in the early 1900s uh, and uh, from a family of distinguished physicians. Uh, Garrard uh, conceived of inborn errors of metabolism um, on the basis of the following. Um, he said that uh, the metabolites in the body, whether we take them in as part of food or, or whether we make them, uh, have to be converted to other metabolites. Uh, this slide uh, depicts them as a substrate uh, to be converted to a product. And he knew that the, the uh, catalyst for that conversion was an enzyme. Uh, but he said that there are certain individuals born with what he called an inborn era of metabolism. Uh, by that he meant that they had a uh, inborn, uh, born with uh, a defect uh, in their ability to convert the substrate to the product, uh, a defect that we now know is in the enzyme, um, uh, uh, which begins, of course, as a genetic mutation uh, in which they cannot uh, produce this uh, metabolic change. Uh, and he further said in his famous Croonian lectures of 1907 before the Royal uh, uh, Society of Medicine uh, in England uh, that they uh, advertise their presence, meaning the inborn errors of metabolism, in some conspicuous way, either by some strikingly unusual appearance of surface tissues or of excreta. Uh, by the excretion of some substance which responds to a test. Now, the second uh, important event that led to newborn screening uh, was the, uh, you might say, further proof of the inborn air metabolism. It was the discovery of PKU in uh, 27 years after uh, the Croonian lectures uh, in individuals who uh, are, were retarded, uh, sometimes very severely retarded. Uh, the, uh, con the development, the, the, the discovery of PKU really illustrated very much of what Garrett said. Uh, basically, uh, it uh, um, uh, advertises its presence uh, in a conspicuous way by the excretion of uh, a substance that responds to a test. In this case, PKU responds uh, to the fer ferric chloride test in urine uh, such that uh, in a normal urine, when one adds ferric chloride, uh, one gets no color change shown by this tube in the middle. And on either side, uh, uh, tubes containing urine from individuals with uh, PKU, um, in which there is a deep uh, green, almost black reaction to the presence of ferric chloride in the urine, which uh, indicates the presence of phenylpyruvic acid, a metabolite of phenylalanine in the urine. And of course, Again, the metabolic pathway uh, that is disrupted in by PKU illustrates the inborn error metabolism. In the normal situation, uh, phenylalanine is normally converted to tyrosine under the influence of an enzyme, uh, phenylalanine hydroxylase, PAH, and that in PKU, uh, this enzyme is defective and therefore phenylalanine does not normally get converted to tyrosine and accumulates in large quantities and we know produces the hyperphenylalaninemia of PKU. The third event that led to newborn screening, uh, the very important event, was the discovery of a diet for PKU. Uh, in 1953, some 19 years after the discovery of PKU, it was discovered, uh, interestingly enough, by a uh, German physician who was a fellow in training at the time at the Children's Hospital in Birmingham, England. Horst Bickel uh, developed the diet uh, that showed uh, that there could be reduction, that is biochemical uh, correction of the uh, abnormalities in PKU and as a matter of fact could also at the same time uh, benefit individuals with PKU. Now, these individuals these of course discovered to have PKU at that time were mentally retarded uh, but what Bickel showed is that the neurologic 
complications beyond mental retardation in PKU could be bettered. If they were having severe seizures that were difficult to control, they were controlled when they were on diet. If they were very hyperactive, they were less hyperactive when they were on diet. Uh, they were more responsive when they were on diet. And so there was no question but that there was a, a correspondence between the biochemical bettering of these individuals and their clinical uh, improvement. Finally comes on the scene uh, Robert Guthrie, the famous Robert Guthrie of, who developed newborn screening. Now, Bob Guthrie, uh, before he developed newborn screening, uh, was a cancer researcher working at the Russell Park Institute for Cancer Research in Buffalo, New York. Uh, he was interested in metabolites in cancer. He developed bacterial assays that would identify certain uh, pyrimidine and purine metabolites in the blood and the urine of individuals with cancer. Uh, but, you know, as so often occurs in uh, in our life and in medicine, uh, um, serendipity, chance, uh, sort of takes over. But um, it's a little like the, uh, the story of, of Winston Churchill. You know, before the Second World War, Winston Churchill was really out of favor in England. And comes the Second World War and his uh, performance and his wonderful leadership in England during the Second World War led to his becoming the very famous Winston Churchill. And, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and becoming so uh, prominent in England. And people said, well, Winston Churchill was really just, uh, just lucky. Well, he said, you know, I was prepared for my luck. Well, uh, Guthrie had a couple of, uh, of chances. They weren't lucky necessarily, but they uh, certainly were events in his life that led to uh, the chance events that led to newborn screening. But he was prepared. Uh, chance favors the prepared mind, so Pasteur said. The first chance that led to newborn screening for Robert Guthrie was that Johnny, his second son, was mentally retarded, not from PKU, his uh, he caused mental retardation, Johnny was never identified. Uh, but because Johnny was mentally retarded, Bob Guthrie and his wife uh, became lifelong uh, interested in uh, the cause of mental retardation, and specifically the prevention of mental retardation. Now, in relation to that interest in mental retardation, uh, Guthrie was the program chairman for the local uh, um, association for retarded children uh, in Buffalo, New York, and it was his responsibility to develop a monthly uh, a program, a talk before the group. Uh, and so uh, one day um, he uh, heard about uh, Dr. Robert Warner, who was director of the Developmental Evaluation Clinic at Buffalo Children's Hospital, um, and uh, the work that Dr. Warner was doing in the prevention uh, or the amelioration of mental retardation through diet. So we asked Dr. Warner to speak before the group, which Dr. Warner did, uh, and uh, what Dr. Warner told them were uh, really three things. <clears throat> he said that um, uh, he did indeed have a diet for this disease, PKU, which improved the behavior of those who were mentally retarded from PKU. But he said that uh, the, it, what you needed was to measure the blood phenylalanine level in these individuals in order to properly monitor the diet. Uh, and uh, he said finally that the problem in monitoring the diet in individuals with PKU was that there was no simple uh, phenyl blood phenylalanine assay to uh, measure phenylalanine. Uh, that the assays that were available at that time were these very complicated tube dilutional assays that uh, uh, really took a long time, were very labor intensive, and, and very, uh, made it very, very difficult to treat individuals with PKU. Uh, and Guthrie thought about that, and remember he was, uh, in his cancer research, he was involved in developing uh, bacterial assays for metabolites. And he said, well, you know, uh, some of my bacterial assays probably could be modified to respond to phenylalanine, and they're really very simple assays. And so indeed, he, he uh, did this. He modified his uh, uh, cancer bacterial assays, and made them applicable to the identification of uh, and measurement of phenylalanine in blood. Uh, and he used that to measure phenylalanine in blood not for purposes of, B, of newborn screening at that time, for, but to uh, aid Dr. Warner in, moder in monitoring the diet for PKU. 
The second chance event that occurred in, in uh, Bob Guthrie's uh, uh, development of uh, newborn screening uh, was that one day he and his wife get a call from uh, Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota, uh, where they were from, uh, informing them that his wife's niece, who was known to be mentally retarded, had just been diagnosed with PKU. And so this put PKU right in, basically, in his family and uh, s truly stimulated his interest in learning more about PKU and also possibly uh, uh, thinking about doing something about it. Now, so he began to learn more about PKU, asking some of his pediatric friends. Bob was a physician, but not a pediatrician, not a practicing physician. Uh, and uh, also reading the literature. And one of the articles that he came upon was a uh, rather famous article uh, published in 1959 by two physicians in Denver, Colorado, uh, Horner and Streamer, uh, called Phenylketonuria Treated from Earliest Infancy. And what they said in that article was, A, that individuals born with PKU had an elevation of phenylalanine for the very first days onward. By the f end of the first day, certainly by the second day, they had a distinct elevation of blood phenylalanine. And B, that if you put them on treatment in the neonatal period, that dietary treatment that Horace Bickle had uh, developed a number of years before, uh, you would prevent mental retardation. And they showed this in, in three cases uh, in their original report. The challenge now became how does one prevent mental retardation in all children born with PKU. Um, in the earlier studies, the one by Horn and Streamer and, and other studies that were beginning to appear similar to that at that time, uh, PKU was discovered in the newborn period in um, individuals born into families in which PKU was already known. Usually a uh, sibling, a brother or sister was already known to be mentally retarded from PKU in the family. Uh, another uh, baby comes along in the family. They anticipate that baby may have PKU, test the baby specifically for blood phenylalanine uh, uh, levels uh, from the very first day onward and found that the baby had PKU or would rule out PKU in these new babies in these families. Um, that's how PKU was discovered uh, in those days. Uh, but that represented only about 20% of all the known individuals born with PKU because as, as an autosomal recessive disorder, we know that only about 20, 25% perhaps, but no more than that, have a family history of PKU. That left out uh, of early dietary treatment the 80% uh, of children who were born uh, into families in which PKU was never uh, even uh, uh, was not known and certainly wasn't even uh, remotely uh, thought about. Uh, so how does one identify PKU in all babies with PKU? You can't identify babies with PKU on the basis of any clinical characteristic in the newborn period. As this slide shows, uh, babies with PKU look like all the rest of the babies uh, in the nursery. There are no clinical manifestations early on of PKU. The answer Bob Guthrie came up with was the Guthrie test, um, <clears throat> cons consisting really of two parts. The first part of the Guthrie test I'll show you in a moment. It's the bacterial assay of Guthrie. But uh, the second part was probably in, in, even more important. That is the development of a simple filter paper dried blood specimen that could be obtained from the heel of the newborn, every newborn very simply. Um, and could be uh, tested for PKU, for phenylalanine and PKU, uh, and could be easily transported to a central laboratory. We know, all know this as the newborn screening uh, specimen. And of course, the, the Guthrie test, the phenylalanine assay for, uh, for PKU, which was simple, could be done uh, in, in, in even uh, not terribly sophisticated laboratories, uh, and uh, would allow for at least a semi-quantitative a measurement of phenylalanine. And as this slide shows, uh, a typical bacterial assay Guthrie test. Uh, you have a, in the center a row of, of standards of controlled discs with graded amounts of phenylalanine to show that the test works and to be able to, um, to uh, 
uh, to uh, use as a measure of phenylalanine in the unknowns. And then throughout this, this plate, uh, you have uh, blood specimens from normal newborns with very, very little uh, growth uh, around the specimen, uh, indicating very little phenylalanine in those specimens. And at the uh, top, uh, almost right-hand corner of the plate, you have a large growth around a blood specimen uh, from a baby with PKU, indicating the uh, increased phenylalanine in that baby. And this is a close-up picture uh, of such a specimen showing uh, those uh, characteristics. In 1963, uh, Guthrie published uh, the assay. He called it a simple phenylalanine method for detecting phenylketonuria in large populations of newborn infants. Um, Now, the, the problem, however, even though it was pretty clear at that point that uh, the assay worked in terms of the uh, neonatal diagnosis of PKU, uh, the problem was really to get it uh, to be adopted by uh, public health laboratories where the uh, only uh, ability to uh, universally screen an individual with PKU would, would, uh, would, would, would be. Um, public health uh, officials in, in New York State uh, were not very, that responsive to doing um, universal uh, routine testing for PKU. Uh, they said that uh, this was not in the public health uh, domain, uh, PKU is not an infectious disease, and at that time public health uh, uh, programs, uh, uh, departments and laboratories were really pretty much uh, exclusively involved in, in infectious diseases. Uh, genetic diseases of this type were just uh, very uh, new to them. Uh, and they said that PKU was much too infrequent, much too rare a disease to justify testing all newborn babies with PKU. So he was frustrated in not getting uh, a state program going in New York State. Uh, but his interest in mental retardation led him to a national meeting of the National Association for Retarded Children, where he met Dr. Robert McCready, director of the Diagnostic Division of the uh, Public Health Laboratories in Massachusetts. Uh, Dr. McCready, shown here, uh, was a physician, a wonderful person, who was interested in mental retardation because he also had a child who was mentally retarded. They met in Chicago at this national meeting. Uh, Dr. McCready learned about Dr. Guthrie's development of this test for PKU that would prevent mental retardation, became very interested in it, uh, returned to Massachusetts, and uh, then went to Buffalo to learn the test at the, in the laboratory of Dr. Guthrie, brought it back to Massachusetts, established it in the Massachusetts laboratory as the first uh, universal newborn screening program uh, in, uh, in the world uh, for PKU. Uh, and within a relatively short period of time, uh, began to show some remarkable results. And here uh, is a uh, uh, publication, one of the letters to the editor that Dr. McCready uh, wrote with regard to the, uh, to the uh, um, results of, of testing of, for PKU. And he says here, out of 53,000 newborn infants tested, the filter paper blood test has revealed the somewhat surprising number of nine positive reactions, all of which have been confirmed. Then he goes on to say all the babies, meaning all the babies with a high phenylalanine level indicative of PKU, uh, were placed promptly on low phenylalanine dietary treatment. Now this is nine out of 53,000, about one in 6,000 babies, and that was a remarkable uh, statement uh, to most people because at that time phenylketonuria was considered to have a frequency of about 1 in 25,000, which was the frequency of PKU in institutions, primarily in institutions for the mentally retarded. And he was saying that, holy crow, the, the frequency of PKU is a whole lot f greater than that, or at least it seemed that way. Uh, so he published this in three, uh, our, uh, as a letter to the editor in three different uh, medical journals and attracted a great deal of attention uh, among, particularly among many state uh, uh, public health officials. And within a very short period of time, many other states uh, uh, 
uh, began to uh, adopt uh, universal newborn screening for PKU. It was clear to Dr. Guthrie and, of course, to Dr. McCready uh, that uh, really two things were still needed to make PK, to make, to allow every single baby in the United States uh, to be uh, identified with PKU in the newborn period for the benefit of, of preventive therapy. Uh, one was that it needed, laws needed to be passed in these states to mandate uh, newborn screening for PKU. Um, despite the fact that some states were, were, were beginning to screen for PKU, it still was not universal in some of those states. And in, in other states, uh, PKU screening was still um, um, uh, resisted. Uh, and uh, Guthrie particularly was very frustrated in convincing those states uh, to, uh, to adopt PKU screening. And so he reasoned that laws absolutely were required to require these states to screen for PKU. Uh, and then, of course, it was very obvious that public health laboratories were needed to screen for PKU. PKU screening would not be universal if it required, if it depended upon uh, individual uh, hospital uh, laboratories. <clears throat> but there were challenges to uh, the public health mandatory approach to newborn screening. Um, some physicians, uh, others said that there was insufficient uh, evidence of benefit from early dietary treatment of PKU. And then there was uh, this uh, bugaboo in, in those days called, quote, socialized medicine. That is that this was the state intruding on the uh, prerogative of the physician uh, to practice private medicine and to make diagnoses themselves. Um, so it wasn't a, a, a clear uh, picture at all. But within a very few years, it was very, very clear uh, that PKU screening was very effective um, in preventing mental retardation. This is a, a picture of uh, siblings, uh, a brother who was, has PKU and who was born uh, before newborn screening and therefore was not diagnosed with PKU until it was too late. And here he is mentally retarded uh, as uh, compared to his uh, uh, normal sister who was identified with PKU and newborn screening and, and treated early with diet. Uh, and pictures like this were repeated uh, over and over again to the point where it was absolutely uh, uh, clear to uh, virtually everybody that the early, that PKU screening in the newborn was effective in preventing mental retardation from PKU. Because of this realization that uh, early uh, dietary treatment from newborn screening was effective in PKU, uh, researchers, uh, metabolic uh, uh, individuals, people who were uh, knowledgeable of metabolic disease um, began to ask the question, uh, are there other inborn errors of metabolism other than PKU that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, were in the same category as PKU, in the same category in a sense that they caused uh, severe problems, mental retardation, uh, even early death, uh, and uh, could be identified in the newborn period if there were a newborn screen for that disease. and. Uh, could be early treated and, and the complications prevented. Uh, maple syrup urine disease was suggested as one of those diseases. Neonatal disease that causes mental retardation, severe ketoacidosis, there's this very rather well-known uh, maple syrup odor use most vomit in the ear. Uh, and there was plenty of blood remaining in the newborn specimen after the one or two discs were removed for simply PKU uh, screening. So Guthrie developed a bacterial assay, really a modification of his PKU assay, uh, that responded to leucine, the amino acid that's elevated in maple syrup urine disease. And indeed, uh, babies with maple syrup urine disease uh, were discovered in those screening programs that added the leucine assay to their phenylalanine assay. For, uh, and uh, here is a picture of uh, my friend Paul. Uh, with maple syrup urine disease discovered in newborn screening. Uh, he's, uh, uh, he's, he's a bit of a wise guy, but, uh, but he's certainly not mentally retarded. Uh, 
Another inborn error metabolism that was in that category is homocystinuria. It produces mental retardation, ectopia lentis, that is dislocation of the ocular lenses, osteoporosis, uh, uh, softening, thinning of the bones, and thromboembolism, uh, blood clotting. Uh, these are three individuals, young ladies with homocystinuria, showing the clinical manifestations. And Guthrie, um, methionine is the elevated amino acid in homocystinuria. Guthrie modified his assay now, bacterial assay, so that it responded to methionine. And that could be added to newborn screening, as it was in a few states. Uh, uh, and here are two individuals, a brother and a sister, with homocystinuria. Uh, the sister on the left-hand side, as you look at the screen, has the clinical complications of homocystinuria because she was born before newborn screening and her brother was identified newborn screening, early treated with a lomothionine diet and uh, is certainly uh, uh, far uh, better off. Then a few years later uh, came congenital hypothyroidism. Now congenital hypothyroidism was a disease well known uh, to physicians uh, as a, um, uh, uh, not a genetic disease, but still a, a disease involving uh, a defect in the production of thyroid hormone so that these individuals uh, became mentally retarded, they had coarse facies, they were hypotonic, uh, they had uh, growth delay. And uh, the group in, in uh, Canada, really, uh, beginning in California, but then the group in Canada developed uh, a, a, back, a radioimmunoassay, uh, which was, uh, uh, could be used for the measurement of, of thyroxine, a thyroid hormone, um, and low thyroxine indicated and does indicate uh, the presence of congenital hypothyroidism in the newborn. Uh, the radiumine assay was a bit of a more difficult test uh, to perform in laboratories than, uh, than the back, simple bacterial assays, but it worked. And congenital hypothyroidism was identified in the newborn period in many, many babies. As a matter of fact, congenital hypothyroidism turned out to be more frequent than PKU. These babies had been placed on, uh, on thyroid supplement, uh, uh, replacement therapy, and, and their uh, and they're fine, as illustrated here by uh, this little So baby. by January of 1999 in Massachusetts, there was multiple, multiple testing going on. Nine disorders were uh, identified in the newborn screen. However, it was also evident that some babies were left out of the mix. These babies, uh, this is an example of a baby with glut glutaric acidemia, Samantha. Uh, with uh, repeated encephalopathic episodes and dystonia left really uh, terribly, terribly uh, 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 damaged. But this is Samantha when she was uh, only four months old, perfectly normal newborn. So glutaric acidemia was a disease that could respond to uh, early neonatal therapy with prevention of the clinical complications if only it could be diagnosed in the newborn period. Now, um, it, it wasn't uh, uh, through a lack of interest in expanding newborn screening that newborn screening early on was not expanded. The, the techniques just simply were not there. Mary Efron here in Boston, along with Dr. McCready, uh, developed a um, chromatographic assay that could be applied to the filter paper newborn blood specimen. Uh, in an attempt to in expand the disorders that were identifiable in newborn screening. And this is a, 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 a picture of a chromatogram uh, from Dr. Uh, Efron and her colleagues' uh, paper um, that uh, illustrated the fact that by this technique, one could, I, could show a great many different uh, amino acids in a single, in a single run. Um, and in Massachusetts and in uh, several other places, urine screening uh, was uh, an attempt to expand newborn screening. Uh, in Massachusetts, for instance, the uh, mother was asked to uh, get a, a dried urine specimen from the diaper of the baby when the baby was three or four weeks of age and send it into the state lab. And that 
urine, dried urine specimen was, uh, was uh, tested by paper chromatography. And again, you can see a number of different uh, amino acid elevations identified in a single assay. So uh, theoretically, this had the advantage of allowing for more uh, disorders to be identified early on in the newborn or just beyond the newborn period uh, for, for, for purposes of, of early treatment, hopefully prevention of clinical complications, and also would allow for a number of different disorders to be identified by a single assay. Uh, so it got around this business of having to have a, an assay for each disorder as the Guthrie testing uh, required. Um, however, the problem was that this was not very effective. Uh, many of the disorders that were diagnosed by urine or blood chromat chromatographic screening were benign and others um, uh, were perhaps serious, but there was no treatment for them. And the kinds of disorders that needed to be identified uh, for which there would be treatment that, would, that were serious and for which there would be treatment that would prevent the complications were not covered necessarily by this type of screening. And then a few years ago, came on the scene something that really met uh, the needs of expanded newborn screening, and that is the biotechnology tandem mass spectrometry, or MSMS. -MS. We know it today as tandem mass spec. Um, it's a machine, um, basically uh, using computerized technology and, uh, uh, and mass spectrometry uh, that works beautifully. And the great advantage of tandem mass spectrometry is that with a single assay, one can get uh, uh, profiles that uh, uh, can indicate a great number of different disorders. Uh, there are two major categories of profiles one gets with tandem mass spectrometry, uh, an asocarnitine profile that will indicate uh, organic acid disorders and fatty acid oxidation disorders, and there's an amino acid profile that will indicate a number of different amino acid disorders, the most uh, prominent of which, of course, is PKU, but a number of other amino acid disorders as well. Now, to uh, meet these challenges, the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, together with the Health Resources and Services Administration uh, and the uh, uh, Maternal and Child Health uh, Bureau of the HRSA, uh, together with other organizations, has um, has begun to get uh, uh, to form uh, to to meet to to begin to address these problems, um, and uh, a task force uh, sponsored by these organizations was uh, formed in 1999, uh, and a number of different. Uh, statements with regard to newborn screening and the state of the uh, of newborn screening came out of that task force. Uh, one was uh, that it was very evident that uh, newborn screening is a, a collaboration between public health programs, laboratories, uh, uh, and a private uh, medicine. Uh, the public health role in newborn screening includes providing testing, uh, to coordinate newborn screening among private uh, pro primary providers, uh, hospitals, laboratories, uh, metabolic genetic centers. And it was also very evident that we needed to have some sort of understanding in the United States of a consistent screening menu before I mentioned uh, that uh, the states uh, in the United States uh, have very different menus for newborn screening. Some screening for three diseases, others screening for 25 diseases. Uh, and the idea here is that that is unfair and that there needs to be some consistency throughout the United States. In order to carry out some of these, um, some of these um, uh, needs and to begin to truly address them in a, in a consistent and practical manner, the American College of Medical Genetics has gotten together with HRSA, MCHB, and, and other organizations uh, to uh, develop a, 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 an approach called toward a uniform screening panel and system. Uh, and there are a series of meetings uh, now going on sponsored by the uh, uh, ACMG and HRSA uh, to begin to, uh, to 
look at many of these issues of newborn screening. Um, the, the principals in this uh, uh, are include Michael Watson, Marie Mann, and Michelle Lloyd Poirier from HRSA. Uh, Michael Watson being the director of ACMG, Pierre Rinaldo, and Rodney Howell. Now, among the um, things that uh, the American College of Medical Genetics has been fostering uh, has been an attempt to have um, a simple explanations of these uh, very complicated new disorders that are being uh, now identified in the newborn screen using expanded newborn screening by tandem mass spectrometry to allow for simple explanations to be given to the practicing physician or the healthcare provider uh, so that this can also, so they, this individual can understand these diseases in their simple form and can also relay this understanding to the families who, are, who they must contact. Uh, these simple explanations have, begin, have been given the name ACT Sheets, and we've uh, developed a, uh, an ACT Sheet for a, a whole host of different uh, metabolic disorders that uh, provides in a single page um, the uh, uh, a, a synopsis of the disorder. This act sheet uh, shown here is uh, one for citral anemia. It identifies it as a urea cycle defect uh, and then immediately tells the uh, health professional uh, what to do when contacted by the laboratory uh, about a baby who might have citral anemia. It says contact the family to inform them of the newborn screening result. Uh, provide feeding instructions, uh, emergency treatment uh, if the baby is symptomatic, and so forth. It goes on to explain in one sentence the meaning of the screening result, and then in uh, a couple of three sentences of uh, the condition, a description, a very brief description that gives a synopsis of, of what this is all about, and then how to confirm the diagnosis and some of the clinical complications that might arise. Um, so. Um, it is, uh, these act sheets are to meet the, the need for immediate uh, and appropriate information on the part of the healthcare professional and the family with regard to contacting uh, a baby who is contacted because of a newborn screening abnormality. There are many other issues, uh, and we'll be hearing about them from in many other different venues, but uh, I think it's fair to conclude by saying that newborn screening is really still in the process of expansion and will be expanding clearly over the next uh, many years. Uh, began with the Guthrie test, got into multiple Guthrie testing, and then congenital hypothyroidism, hemoglobinopathies have been added to newborn screening over the years, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, biotinidase deficiency, most recently the great expansion provided by tandem mass spectrometry and many other uh, conditions are, are going clearly to be able to be applied to that newborn blood specimen for purposes of newborn screening in the future years. The challenges that we are going to be facing is how to best provide newborn screening uh, for all concerned.